What up, what up? Esoteric Eddie here. Namaste. In this video, I am interviewing my colleague, Symbolic Studies. This is a video that we did a little while back on Instagram. If you're not following me on there, make sure to follow me at Esoteric Eddie so that you can check out all this other content that I post daily, weekly, and monthly that you might miss that I don't post on here. Anyways, have fun. Peace. What's up, what's up? Hey, Eddie, how's it going, man? Hey, pretty good, man, pretty good. Good yeah. morning, good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, thanks for hanging out, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was really stoked that you reached out. So uh, I appreciate your work, and uh, I need to dig into it more on YouTube and everything. Uh, but what I've seen so far in the interviews I've checked out, I'm totally into it. So good stuff all around. Thank you, thank you. Likewise, man, you got, you got some really in-depth content. This is a new series I'm starting, but kind of just filling it out, you know? Um, so uh, it's just esoteric hangout. This is the second one I've done. The first one I did was on TikTok with a good brother named uh, Become Set Apart. Nice, but, nice. Uh, I'm into it, man. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, yeah, man, you ready to just get into some basic questions and just go with the flow? For sure, let's go for it. All right, man. So first of all, um, tell the people who you are and then uh, what you do. Yeah, so my name is Mario Garza. I have a project called Symbolic Studies, and you can check me out, obviously, here on Instagram. Uh, I am on TikTok as well, so symbolic.studies on Instagram, symbolic studies on TikTok. I've got a YouTube. I've got a Patreon. Um, you know, basically what I do is, at the moment, I pretty much focus on following each sign during the sign itself and put out content based around that. So right now I'm digging into Virgo, so I'm looking into older myths uh, associated with Virgo and what's going on there. And uh, I've been doing it for over a year, so I have content on all the signs. And I really like to do really short, dense pieces, you know, where I just try and put in as much information as possible. And so um, that's pretty much the main uh, thing behind it. I also make artwork based on the signs as well. So I've got an Etsy, I've got a few posters up there. The idea is to complete uh, a whole series for the Zodiac, a whole collection of them, you know? Um, and so uh, before that, though, I was doing design work for a long time. So you can see that uh, that's kind of carried over into how I present my information and everything. So I'm a very visual person. I really like it for it to be, you know, as uh, visually appealing as possible. And since we're dealing with symbolism, you know, it kind of helps to be able to see a lot of visuals and things like that. So that's pretty much the gist of it. Absolutely. I'm sure you're obviously aware of a uh, Joe for boss chart. I've seen you post. Yeah. So yeah, you know, totally. You think you're going to try and tackle kind of like his Zodiac series, something like that one day, do your own illustration. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely my own interpretation. Um, and I saw that you did a little documentary about his work, right? Um, yeah. That's really cool, man. Yeah. He, he really blew me away when I first saw his stuff, you know? And so uh, very similar. Yeah. Where I think that, he had so many uh, connections and he understood so much of this stuff that he just had to express it in some way, shape or form. And so when you look at his work, you know, it's layered. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, really, really prolific guy, you know. So, um, yeah, something along those lines, you know. Uh, yeah, obviously, clearly my own aesthetic and everything else. But, yeah, definitely I've taken inspiration from what he's done in that regard for sure. Ooh, man. Yeah, I know. I always saw his artwork in like different documentaries. I'm like, who is this guy? Like, who made this stuff? And then when I came across his biography, I was like, man, I gotta do a video on this guy because there there are none out there in English that I could find. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I think you're right for sure. But, uh, anyways, getting back to you. So, so how did you get started? When did you get started? What's what's the origin story of Symbolic Studies? Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I was a graphic designer for about 20 years. And, you know, um, because of that, I've always been interested in symbolism, you know, uh, because I was working with a lot of icons and illustrations and stock art, and I'm hearing, uh, you know, client requests on what they want for their project and everything else. And so I refined my eye, you know, over a number of years. And so I always was interested in decoding, you know, uh, the symbolism of billboards and advertisements and things like that. And so I just found myself kind of collecting a lot of information about certain shapes 
and colors and compositions and kind of figured out what actually worked, what, what was appealing to people, you know, what resonated with people. And so um, at a certain point, I realized that you can actually just study symbolism itself and that symbolism was a thing. And I would say for me personally, um, that what really kind of kicked things off was when I was interested, became interested in tarot. And so a friend of mine wanted me to design a tarot website. And he said, if you're going to design it, then you should know how the cards work. You should know how the system works. And so uh, he bought a handful of tarot books and he let me borrow a few. And I opened up a few books and that was kind of it. It's like the floodgates sort of opened in a way. Um, and so I thought I understood symbolism before that, uh, but I realized that I really didn't know much of anything. So tarot kind of led me to astrology and it led me to a lot of other things related to occultism and magic and mysticism and spirituality and things like that. And so um, once I started collecting books on symbolism as well, I didn't realize that there was like literally reference books on symbolism, dictionaries of symbols and things like that. That kind of became a thing. And then after a while, I just figured that I had to kind of get it out there somehow. So it was definitely a slow burn to actually launch symbolic studies, but eventually I did it. And I realized that the structure of the Zodiac for me personally was really helpful. And so otherwise I feel like I probably, you know, I don't know if my output would have been consistent, but just having some sort of schedule in mind, just following the tropical system and saying, hey, I know what I'm starting Virgo, I know what I'm starting, you know, Libra or whatever, that was really, really helpful. And I realized that I actually kind of liked having that structure. And so, um, so yeah, so I launched Symbolic Studies in uh, October 2020. And then I really started uh, being consistent, um, like April 2021, something like that. That's pretty cool, man. That's like right around the same time I started doing Esoteric Eddie, it was like December of, uh, or no, sorry, no, I started around December 2021. You said 2020? Okay. Uh, October 2020, then I took a little bit of a break, and then it was early-ish in 2021 that I start being really consistent with things, yeah. That's cool, man. Though. That's a very, like, detailed, you know, way to get into it. It seems like a lot was going on, and you were kind of just – it was unfolding for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, and for me, too, doing design work for so long, I realized that I just wanted to focus my design efforts – on a personal project instead of always being hired out for it. And so I've always been a very um, kind of like a, an entrepreneurial sort of minded person. And so even when I was doing design work for a lot of people, it was always freelance. It was always on my own accord. You know, I look for clients, things like that. And so I felt like I just needed to, to shift gears and, um, you know, just start talking about some of this information. And, you know, I'm just like yourself, I'm really curious to learn more. So that was the other thing that I had in mind was like, if I am able to do this, make it viable, make it sustainable, then I'm going to learn even more because I'm going to be spending all my time just diving into this information. Absolutely, dude. Yeah. Do you, are there any uh, symbols in particular that, you know, that you like or that you're drawn to? Yes, man, for sure. Um, and so right now, I usually talk about it more on podcasts and shows like that. But um, I have this deep, deep love for everything based around the northern sky. And in particular, the North Star, which is also called the Pole Star, which is also called Polaris. And everything that that represents has been a huge thing for me. Uh, over the last, I would say, two or three years. And so I really realized how significant this star is. And so I've done a presentation largely about the pole star and what it represents symbolically. And so for people who don't know, you know, the North Star, you can look at it in the night sky and uh, all of the stars revolve around the North Star. And so if you were to take a time-lapse photo of the North Star, it creates a big streak a big circular streak around the North Star. So it's almost like the hub of the wheel. It's the hub of the cosmic wheel from the perspective of Earth, you know? And what I didn't realize until maybe a few years ago was that a lot of cultures revered this part of the night sky, that star in particular, and then also several of the constellations that immediately revolve around the North Star. And so including uh, 
you know, uh, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And so Ursa Major and Ursa Minor both have seven stars to them. These, this is the Big Dipper and Little Dipper. Um, you know, as a kid, I think most people can recognize and acknowledge the Dippers, right? I remember being a kid and being able to see it for myself. But it wasn't until years and years later did I realize that there's all of this really, really deep esoteric information about the Dippers themselves and about the Northern Sky and the North Star. So the main gist of it is that um, there's a lot of cultures that believe that we came from the Northern Sky and that we returned to the Northern Sky and that there is an actual stairway to heaven, symbolically, I would say, and that it exists in the Northern Sky. And so I found a lot of information about this. Uh, I've been really fortunate to actually know uh, at least one person who dove really deep into this information in real life. He, he was a friend before I started getting into this information. And then I started bringing it up and I'm like, hey man, I'm like, there's just so much stuff that I'm learning about the Northern Sky and the North Star. And he turned me on to a bunch of different books about it and articles about it. And he started kind of filling in the gaps for me because this was a passion of his years ago. And so, um, through a series of synchronistic events for me personally, I came across some older books that really got into it. I started meeting people online who knew something about it and things just really started clicking. And so for me right now, that's kind of the thing that I personally, when I'm not doing uh, astrological stuff on my channel, uh, I'm diving deep into uh, all of that stuff and what it represents. And it is a huge, huge, huge rabbit hole. So there's many, many threads to pull at with it. And so that's kind of the thing that I like to geek out on, for sure, is the North Star. Okay. Yeah, that sounds pretty intense, man. I, I never really dug into that. But I'm wondering, like, is there any correlation with the North Star and, and the, the Sirius um, constellation or the Pleiadian constellation? Dude, that is an awesome, excellent question, man. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, because... When you first start getting into this information, specifically uh, the Pleiades, you know, so the Pleiades, uh, it's seven stars. So people refer to them as the seven sisters. It sits just above Taurus, right? Um, and so when you look into Pleiadian information, um, there's a lot of stuff relating to that constellation. That sounds exactly like what I just said, right? Of, uh, you know, oh, we have ancestors that come from there, the Pleiadians and everything else, and that we go there after death and we come from there. This is where our species is from, things like that. And actually, in my personal opinion, um, I actually think that a lot of the mythology that's associated with the Pleiades, um, in a way, was swapped or switched or uh, something to that effect over the ages. And that what we're actually, the symbolism that we're referring to makes actually a lot more sense um, when you're discussing the North Star and Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And I've actually, I mean, I'm not saying just because I've talked to people about this, that's correct, but I've talked to very serious astrologers who have an understanding of Northern symbolism as well. Uh, one in particular that I'm thinking of, and we had this exact conversation and pretty much I've, I've discussed this with several researchers and they're kind of in agreement with me. And uh, we've all kind of come to the same conclusion is that a lot of the pleading information is actually talking about Northern symbolism. Uh, but at some point there was a switch and this switch actually has a lot to do with, um, you know, heliocentrism versus geocentrism, which is a whole conversation and it's a whole entire debate. Right. Um, and in many ways, I'm still neutral on it, but essentially what I think happened was that we have, in the modern world, we are taught a solar understanding of this reality, of this kind of, uh, of this universe and of this system. So we call it a solar system, right? You know, that's what we're taught in school. But based on my understanding, on my research, it's actually uh, more perhaps accurate to say that we live in a polar system. And so there are deities and gods, as an example, that we re refer to being uh, heliocentric um, uh, archetypally, you know, that they're related to the sun, essentially. And what I'm learning is that there's actually deities that we say are sun-based and are related to the sun, but in actuality, in the ancient world, they're not solar deities. They weren't solar deities. They were actually polar deities. 
they're talking about what's referred to as the Axis Mundi. And so uh, I read this book called um, The Night of the Gods by this guy named John O'Neill. And he gets really into this. I think it came out in like 1893 or something like that. Uh, one of my friends, she runs a bookstore. Uh, she's really, really awesome. She's been very supportive throughout my whole entire journey with all this information. And she went to a smaller bookstore. She was like in their back room looking for all of their uh, books that are actually like, you know, out on the floor and things like that. And she came across this book and she started looking through it. And she looked through the table of contents and she was like, Mario should read this book. So she bought this book, kind of a rare book. You, I actually have never seen it available on eBay. I've never seen it available anywhere used. You can find PDFs, but you can't find an actual physical copy whenever I've looked. So once again, it's called The Night of the Gods by John O'Neill. And he, yeah, and I can send you the PDFs if you're interested. And so um, he goes in on Northern symbolism in a way that I've never seen before. And it's a very dense book. It's one of the hardest books I've ever read because he, uh, he refers to multiple languages in the book and he translates them. It's kind of dry, but he has a whole entire section called Polar versus Solar Worship or Solar versus Polar Worship. And he uses the example of this god, Ptah from Egypt. So Ptah stands upright, he has a staff, and he's shaved and this is actually where we get like the oscar statue from supposedly and so he's very upright and he's kind of stiff and if you look into what people say about pata you're going to see a lot of solar symbolism associated and attached to him and what john o'neill says is that he's actually a polar deity so what they're referring to is what used to be called the axis mundi and so the axis mundi is this central pole of earth that basically is the bridge between realms. And so it's actually the world tree. You know, the world tree symbolically, like there's so much going on there. That would, that would be like a secondary symbol that I would say is like what I'm really fascinated with right now. And they're very much related. But the world tree is a symbol that symbolically represents this pole or post or pillar that uh, bridges the realms together. You know, and so when I think of Mercury or Hermes or one of these psychopomps that goes between realms and is like the guide of souls, you know, uh, they're going up and down this post or pillar or pole or world tree. You know, this is kind of like the serpent around uh, the tree trunk. You know, this is kind of like the Kundalini snakes around uh, your spine. You know what I mean? And so um, he was saying that this is what Pata represents. Pata represents the central pole or the central axis you know, the world axis or the world pillar. And so he was saying that modern Egyptologists have misattributed a lot of symbolism to these deities. And we think everything is solar based, but in actuality, there was a lot of ancient groups and cultures that were polar based, not solar based. And so um, that's something that I'm really interested in too, um, just to kind of like go on a quick tangent about that is that, you know, I'm, I love astrology. I spent all of my time researching the signs, everything else. But the astrological system that we have now is solar in nature, you know? So it's the path of the ecliptic. It's the path of the sun. That's how we determine what signs are part of the zodiac, is the path of the sun, right? My understanding is that there's been several sky clocks. So that's the sky clock most people acknowledge these days. There's been several sky clocks, including a lunar sky clock, which some cultures still revere and still use, like Islam and Judaism, you know, their holy days are based on the moon. They're not based on the sun, you know? And so for a long time, the moon was actually the preeminent sort of way to understand what's going on with time and the cycles of the heavens and everything else. Well, before that, uh, my understanding is that it was actually a circumpolar sky clock. And so circumpolar means that it's the uh, constellations just around the North Star and they actually don't dip below the horizon for most people. So like 90% of the world can see the North Star. 90% of the population of the world can see the North Star, including uh, populations in, in India and China, where a lot of really, really old ancient information comes from, you know? So you have to be pretty far south to not be able to see it. And most people live above that border or that line. And so circumpolar constellations are the constellations that closely revolve around the northern sky 
around the pole star, including Ursa Major and Minor. And so Ursa Major, it goes around the pole star. And my understanding was that this used to be one of the most pri primitive ancient sky clocks that there was. And so they were li literally looking at Ursa Major go around the North Star. And this is how they understood time because it goes around it once a year, basically. You know, so a lot of people think that this is where we get the swastika from, actually. So uh, Ursa Major kind of makes like a little bend, you know, in its, uh, with the way it's designed. And so a lot of people think that Ursa Major, if you were to look at Ursa Major around the North Star once a season, so four times a year, that actually what you're seeing is the swastika develop, you know. And so this is my understanding of what it actually truly represents and what it actually truly, truly means. You know, it, it's symbolic of the rotation of the heavens in and of itself, but it's also symbolic of the four seasons. It's symbolic of Ursa Major. And right in the middle of the swastika, that axis would be the North Star, you know? And so this is, once again, what everything revolves around in the heavens. Epic, man. You just gave me a whole lot of homework to do. So <laughs> right on, right on. I'm happy about that or a little bummed, but a lot. <laughs> I would be happy to talk to you about it sometime, man, because there's a lot of threads to pull, you know? Absolutely. But it's really funny. Once you start looking into it, um, you start realizing that it's, um, it's kind of not everywhere, I would say, but it's a lot of places that you wouldn't expect. So as an example, just real quick, too, um, you know, uh, the Christmas tree is the world tree. And when you put a star on top of the Christmas tree, you are putting the North Star on top of the world tree. Mm. And, where, where, and where does Santa come from? Where is he from? He's from the North Pole. You know, and so it's just, it's kind of embedded and encoded in a lot of different things that you wouldn't realize. And so for me, I, I refer to it, uh, all of this information uh, as the gift that keeps on giving, essentially, <laughs> because okay. it's just, there's just so much going on there. It's been really rich for me just to dive into it. So, so yeah. that I would say is my favorite symbol to answer your question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we've got a quick question from, from the chat here. Um, you probably mm -hmm. already answered this in, from the segment you just did, but um, Marie C. Lux wants to know, is the North Star related to a zodiac sign? You know, that's a really great question. Um, I actually think that I would say yes, uh, that probably if you're going to attribute a zodiac sign to it, it's actually the 13th sign. So it's not the original 12, but it's actually a fucus. I think there's a lot of a fucus symbolism tied to the North Star. And I think that in a way, it's a failed reference to the North Star. And um, because of the way the system works, because the Zodiac wheel is a wheel, and then there's a hub right in the middle of it, there's an axis point, there's an axle, uh, there's the North Star in the middle of it, symbolically. Um, I would say that they're actually all emanations of what I'm referring to, you know? And so if everything comes from this um, symbolically, from this point in the sky and returns there, I think they're actually all reflections of it. I think they're all metaphors for the North Star in a lot of ways, if that makes sense. And so um, I think that they all have a relationship to it. I would say that I would recommend that she watches my Aquarius and the North Star video, actually. So I, I tie Aquarius uh, to this star in particular in a lot of different ways. And I actually created a whole presentation around it so I put that out during Aquarius, and then uh, it was requested of me to put together a larger presentation about it. And so I went in on it even further for like an hour and a half, and I answered questions at the end and everything else. So my understanding is, is that as I dive deep into every single sign, I find Northern symbolism. I find North Star references. I find references to all this stuff. Um, and so I think that they're all kind of related to it in some way, shape or form, because there is that built in relationship of all of them revolving around this central point. And I would say too, probably if there's a God or a deity that specifically relates to the North Star, I would actually say it's Mercury. And so that's something that I'm probably going to publish more information on, you know, uh, down the road is that mercurial symbolism is very much tied into all of this stuff that I'm talking about, which is why he's often uh, related to the pillar and the pole and the post and things like that. 
Okay, another question here. Sure. Um, coming from Cropped Locks. What up? Um, they say, hi, are there connections to the planet Venus and the North Star? Yeah, you know, um, I would say for sure. I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, you know, but let's just, you know, real quick, uh, the circumpunct symbol, right? This is the symbol for the sun. So it's a circle and there's a dot right there in the middle. Symbolically, that dot right in the middle is kind of a reference to everything that I'm talking about you know, is this central point. I call it the sacred center as well. And so when you start diving into that symbol, which it looks very much like the symbol for Saturn as well, right? Or it looks like the uh, uh, aerial view of Saturn, excuse me. So the ring, and then you have the planet in the middle. Um, when you look at the circumpunct, the circle with the dot in the middle, what they say is that the circle came from the dot, but the dot also came from the circle. So it's almost kind of like this chicken and egg scenario symbolically that they, they came from each other, you know, essentially. And so it's this looping sort of thing. It's kind of like this toroidal sort of thing. So have you studied the toroid by chance, uh, the torus field? Do you know what that looks like? It looks like a donut sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, like feeds into itself. Exactly, it feeds into itself, you know. And so if everything came from the center and then it comes out, but then it comes right back into itself, it's all part of the same system. You know, so the outer part of the toroidal field was the inner part of the toroidal field and vice versa. And so to me, when you bring up pretty much anything, uh, whether it's Venus or a deity or anything else, the way I tend to personally see it these days is, is very much a similar sort of setup or, or relationship is that no matter what you bring up in the natural world, no matter what constellation you bring up, no matter what star system you bring up or whatever, it all came from this sacred center. Um, and so it's going to be a reflection of it, you know? So um, I think absolutely you can find uh, Venusian symbolism, you know, connected to the North Star for sure. And once again, I would recommend my Aquarius and North Star video because I think there is some overlapping information with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely check out Mario's YouTube channel. Symbol it's Symbolic Studies on there too, right? Yes, yeah, for sure. All right, cool, man. I'm wondering, have you had any, like, deep paranormal experiences, spiritual, psychedelic, extraterrestrial, anything like that that has shaped <laughs> the process you've been on? You know, I mean, just being completely, like, honest about things. Yeah, cannabis really opened me up, man, uh, in so many different ways. And so it was something that I uh, delayed sort of my um, – curiosity with that for a very long time and so i didn't really smoke or try anything until my mid-20s you know so i had this kind of you know big long span of time um to do my thing a certain kind of way and not really try anything and then once i did it really opened things up for me you know that's when i really started getting into a lot of alternative information um conspiratorial type information stuff like that and uh it really got me to see things in a new way for sure and um it got my interest in like ufology extraterrestrial information um just to deepen as well and so i was already interested in that you know i think we grew up in a generation where we were just exposed to a lot of sci-fi films and like, you know, a lot of shows that kind of talk about this, the X-Files, you know, things like that. And I was always interested in it, to be honest. And I was a pretty casual X-Files fan, I guess. And, but it wasn't until, you know, after I had some of these experiences that I really want to know more, like, no, what's really going on here with all this stuff? Cause I had uh, an experience when I was younger where I thought I saw something. It wasn't anything significant. It was way out in the distance, but it was something anomalous in the sky, you know. And uh, when I started getting into alternative information, I came across this interview with this guy named Ed Grimsley. And I think it was like an archived coast to coast interview or something along those lines, right? And he was a veteran and he served and he was given a pair of night vision goggles. And he said that he, I can't even remember where he was at, but he was stationed somewhere. And he got these military grade night vision goggles and he looked up in the night sky and he started seeing stuff. He started seeing very anomalous activity. And apparently he had an experience when he was younger where he was already a believer 
and these sorts of things, but that the night vision really kind of like showed him that this is still going on and you know it's just like right underneath your nose kind of thing it's it's veiled but if you choose to look you're going to see stuff and so that inspired me to get a new credit card and to buy a pair of military grade night vision goggles like a decade ago and so uh i did that and the first night i got them man i saw triangular craft and so really? people yeah people call it the tr3b usually and so it was a triangular craft. You could see the body. It wasn't just like this glowing sort of thing. There was lights in every single corner. And I just looked out my bedroom window. You know, it was the first day that I had it. I looked out the window with my night vision. And I just, I could not believe it. It was like the first 10 seconds, honestly. And this triangular craft just cruised by. And it blew my mind, you know, obviously. And so I would say for a good maybe two or three summers, I was really, really into sky watching with my night vision. And from doing that, dude, I saw so many different things. Um, things that I still don't, I don't have any conclusion. I don't have a grand conclusion, but I saw a lot of stuff. And so people don't realize how much activity is actually going on up there. And I've shown it to people when people would come in town, I would be like, hey dude, let's go sky watching. I have these goggles. You know, and I had multiple people like tear up and cry after seeing something because it was such a significant experience for them. And so I also had a, a green laser, like a fairly powerful green laser. And so whenever I saw anything in the sky, I would point my laser, you know, at whatever I was looking at. If, if I knew it wasn't a plane or, or a helicopter or something like that, you know. And there was one experience that I think probably cuts the deepest for me was I was with my girlfriend. We were at a school. It was probably like 10 or 11 p.m. We were just in the field. This is Portland, Oregon. And we're looking up in the sky. And I see a couple of things up in the sky, which is really common. You know, you, you see stuff. There's just there's stuff going on up there. And so there's two like balls of light. There was like a really dense ball of light and there was a really soft ball of light. And I noticed it and I pointed my laser, the green laser at them. And you can actually tell when you hit these things because they kind of glow a little bit, just, just enough to see that you're actually hitting something in the sky. And so I knew I got them. And as soon as I hit them, they were kind of like, it almost looked like uh, dog fighting with airplanes or something. They were doing something in the sky where they were going around each other and almost looked like they were chasing each other or something like that. I hit them with the laser and the dense ball of light took off. And then the glowy ball of light, the more fuzzy ball of light came down and it started sweeping the horizon and it started going along the horizon line. And I kept on following it with my laser. And I told my girlfriend, I'm like, oh, well, they, they broke up now and this one's moving along. And I was still following it with my laser. And I thought that it was really far away. It's kind of hard to tell the distance with some of these things, you know, um, just because of the way the night vision works and just the way everything works. It's, it's very difficult to have a, a true understanding of distance. Um, but I was following this thing and I thought it was way far away. Well, it actually passed in front of uh, this tree line that was maybe like two blocks away. And I was like, oh shit, I'm like, this thing is really close actually. And so it went in front of the trees and then it started coming towards us and it literally came all the way towards us and it literally went through us. So it went from being in the night sky, way, I don't know how far up there, doing its thing with this other light I acknowledged it, it knew I was there, it came down, and then it literally came right through us. And then it just, it literally just got, it came towards us and it got bigger and bigger and bigger and it just passed right through us. And then I looked behind and it, it wasn't there anymore, you know? And so I don't know, again, I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, there was enough intelligence behind it to know that I was communicating with it. And that is one thing that I will say about some of the things that I have seen. Um, I, once I started seeing this stuff through the night vision, by the way, I started having naked eye daytime experiences, seeing things as well. Probably the most significant thing like that 
uh, related to what I'm, I'm related to my main point was that uh, in New York, I saw this um, UFO in the sky and it looked like this metallic, I don't even know how to describe it. It was like this metallic shimmery sort of thing. It's almost kind of like the predator sort of veil or whatever. And it was turning into itself. It looked like it was basically like morphing into itself and coming out of itself sort of thing. And we saw it for like maybe 20 seconds or something like that. We were actually on a bus on the way to the city from Philadelphia. And we saw it hovering above, um, you know, this building. And then we eventually got away from it. We couldn't see it anymore. But the thing that I picked up was that this is intelligent, you know, that there's something going on here that this isn't just, um, I don't know, this isn't something that doesn't have any kind of like consciousness to it. There's a, there's a consciousness to it. And so that to me is something that I would say I picked up over the years was that I've had enough experiences to know that some of these things actually are significant and that there's something kind of going on there intelligence wise so um yeah so those are my experiences with that kind of stuff there's definitely a lot of things up there once again i don't have any grand conclusions but i know that there's a lot of activity way more than what people would realize that is wild man i was not expecting that answer um uh, (laughs) i know what i'm getting for christmas this year i'm getting night vision goggles and a green laser (laughs) Nice. You know, uh, if you if anyone out there is actually serious about doing that, it really pays to get a good pair. Um, and so because you're just going to see way, way more stuff. And I would say the other thing advice that I would give people is if they ever had an opportunity to use it, I saw way more stuff in the city than I ever did out in the country or the woods. And so there's something going on with people. For some reason, there's there, there's a correlation between what how much stuff you're going to see and the population density. And so whenever I did it within the city, I always saw stuff. And it's definitely stuff that you you can tell the difference, you know, between a plane and a helicopter and everything else and a drone. That might be trickier these days. A lot of drones, there's a lot more drones out there than there used to be, you know, but I saw a lot more stuff uh, in neighborhoods and cities and towns and things like that than I ever did, you know, out in the sticks or whatever so the first few times i went out i'm like oh yeah we're gonna go to the woods and you're gonna be able to see everything because there's no light pollution and stuff like that but i never ended up seeing anything the most significant uh sightings were were in the city so uh have you seen stuff before man um when i was a kid yeah we were driving through probably um like new mexico or texas or something on our way to mexico and me and my, it was me and my family in the van, and probably like eight of us or something, but only me and my mom were awake at the time. And we just see this like ball of light, like out in the distance, you know, like three in the morning or something. And it just kind of like zoomed really close by us and then took off. But we were so tired. We were just like, what? Like, did that really just happen? <laughs> yeah, right. But that's really the, I mean, I've seen weird like orbs and things in the sky. Like me and my friends, we used to hang out in his backyard and turn off all the lights and, you know, puff on some cannabis too and just look up, man. Like we would just look up and, and when you spend hours doing that, you will see stuff. And we would see like weird things like flashes, like these little these flashes in the sky and then followed by these dark objects with no lights. And it's just, I've seen some weird things, but nothing as you know, um, in your face as like a craft or anything like that. Most of my experiences in life have been revolved around like paranormal stuff, actually. Oh, really? Um, Yeah, but that's a conversation for another day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I bet. (laughs) But rest assured, you know, um, I mean, that made me a believer uh, the first few times. I was already a believer, but it's really different when you just absorb this information because I had read books on it and everything else. It's really different when you read it and you watch it in a documentary and you hear people talk about it and you hear people's experiences with it, it's a different ball game when you experience it yourself, you know? And I'll just say personally, the first couple of times I really saw something, uh, I felt this, I don't know, it was either this loneliness or this dread or something. I, I, I can't describe it. It was a weird, weird feeling. It did not make me feel comfortable. I'll just put it that way, you know, because you realize then that there are things there's things out there, whatever it might be, wherever the crafts might come from or whatever. But I've seen so much exotic stuff, you know, that I used to think that, oh, well, it's all military. 
You know, that was one of my first conclusions. Oh, it's all military crafts and stuff. And it's like black budget stuff and underground stuff and everything else. Um, but when you see the variety of the things uh, that are actually out there, you can't say that any longer that there's actually like, um, there's this, I think there's a spiritual connection here. I think some of the things that I've seen, I think they're basically entities, essentially. You know, I remember showing a Muslim friend of mine and uh, he saw stuff. We saw stuff together. And he was like, I think these are jinn. I think some of the things you're seeing actually literally are jinn, you know, that we can basically barely perceive a smaller aspect of them, you know, just maybe their light body or whatever, but that there's actually, you know, perhaps, a, um, you know, a more um, fleshed out body on another realm or whatever, on another density or frequency or whatever you want to say, you know. And so to me, I think that there's something going on up there where, some of these things are alive, you know, whether you would say that they're spiritual entities or they're creatures or they're animals or they're insects or whatever. Some of these things look like they're actually alive and they look like almost like a bug swimming in water or something like that, you know. And so that was one of my experiences, experiences just seeing some of this stuff and just thinking like, you know, this is definitely not a, a mechanical craft some of these things are actually alive, you know, but I can't explain it beyond that. Yeah, I've come to pretty much the same conclusion. Um, I have a documentary too on my channel, Esoteric Eddie TV, um, where I kind of connect the whole psychology and UFO. And, um, I kind of come to the same conclusion after reading Young's book on UFOs. It's like there's some kind of like subconscious aspect going on. There's some kind of conscious interaction that's happening. It's not just physical. Yes. Yeah, 100%, man. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so we got a couple more questions. Um, I will get sure. to the questions a little later, but I wanted to segue. That yeah, was a great yeah. thing. So I wanted to segue into the ne my next question, which was, um, of course, symbols obviously are sigils, right? But they can be sigils, and sigils can be used for magic, um, or at the very least, sigils can be used to tap into the subconscious or the psyche and influence us. So I was wondering um, if you have any thoughts or information on um, governments or corporatocracies utilizing symbols or sigils for maybe nefarious reasons. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. You know, um, it's like propaganda 101. It's mind control 101 symbolism, you know. And so if you're going to program the masses or if you're going to program an individual, uh, the symbolism aspect is extremely important. And in a lot of ways, because I've, I've looked into mind control uh, information at length, you know, for a number of years, actually. And um, how you program an individual versus how you program, say, a country, there's a lot of information that overlaps, and there are some differences as well, you know. But symbolism plays an integral part in that. And so, you know, if you take any country that has... Um, you know, uh, nefarious agendas or whatever, their propaganda arm, this is like one of the things that they concern themselves with, right? It's just like, what are the right key phrases to get people to do X, Y, or Z? What are the right campaigns to get people to do X, Y, or Z? Um, and so um, this is largely what advertising is all about. And so I've done design work once again for like 20 years. And I was a freelancer throughout that whole time, but I freelanced for ad agencies. You know, I freelance for, I've worked with like Intel and Nike and Adidas and like these kinds of companies, you know? And so it's like these companies, you know, they have psychologists at their disposal. They have agencies at their disposal to give them, you know, the right types of information on how to, um, you know, basically uh, increase their bottom line, you know. And so for a government or something, they have a different kind of bottom line, right? And so, um, yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, that is one of the key sort of things out there is symbolic sort of uh, programming, you know, and um, subliminal programming as well, you know, subliminal advertising. And so I read this really interesting book about um, subliminal ads. I think it came out in like the 70s or 80s, but a lot of the ads that they were referring to were from the 60s and 70s. And some of the stuff that this guy talked about in this book just 
completely blew my mind. So little tiny things that you would never expect to see um, be effective in an ad were completely effective. And they found this out through, uh, you know, focus groups and things like that and marketing research and everything else. So as an example, um, he referred to um, some ads, right? Everybody kind of knows about the ads where they embed like a skull or they in embed something into like an ice cube. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a classic back in the day, like on YouTube. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so um, this is called the hell cell technique. And so literally, you put death imagery, you put spiders, you put demons, you put all of these really heinous, dark things, you know, and you basically you kind of airbrush it into back in the day into these ice cubes. Or if there's a tree. You know, you can put something that's very um, dark and disturbing within the branches of the tree. And your conscious mind doesn't pick it up, but your con your unconscious mind, your subconscious picks up, like, everything, you know? So it's your conscious mind that actually filters things out, but there's a part of us that picks up everything else, you know? And so um, he was saying in the book that there's different ways to grab people's attention and kind of like so, um, go underneath their conscious mind, bypass it to their subconscious. And a lot of times it's through these very simple techniques that they just found were effective over the years or whatever. So like one example, another example he gave was that, you know, um, in some ads, they will intentionally have like weeds and grass growing over people's feet and that not showing their feet was there was some sort of subconscious trigger within that that got people to pay attention more to the ad right i was like oh that's really curious i'm like that seems really random i'm not sure what that's all about but i had a lot of old magazines and i think i bought a lot of old magazines for this purpose and i started looking through these old magazines from like the 60s and 70s and I found a cigarette company that used this technique in like a dozen different ads. And so all of the ads were like a couple out in the woods and they're like smoking a cigarette and it's like the sunset or something like that. And sure enough, man, like all of their feet, you could not see any of their feet. And it would just show like this grass going over their feet or their feet would be behind a log or their feet would be behind a rock or their feet would be behind a bush or something like that. And so I'm like, wow, this, I mean, it's, you know, what this guy was saying is actually accurate. Like they're, this is what they're doing in this campaign, you know? And so they wouldn't do that for no reason, you know? And so a lot of these little types of techniques, they can be very, very effective if you know what you're doing. And you better believe that, you know, these governments and things like that are aware of all of this stuff. And so my personal opinion is the way technology works and the way a lot of new information works, it comes from the military first. And so it comes from the military and then it's seeded out, you know? And so um, this seems to be the pattern of things. And so um, I think that a lot of this information comes from that world first, from the military industrial complex, and then it gets kind of seeded out. You know, I think there's a lot of corporations, especially now, you know, that they do their own research, they have their own information regarding all of this stuff. Um, but I think that, you know, the military tends to have it first. The military tends to be at the bleeding edge of all technology, you know, that's just kind of how it is. And so I think that they're a lot of the first ones to use it. So if you look at military advertising and commercials, you're gonna see a lot of stuff there that just kind of blows my mind, you know. And so uh, nowadays I see a lot of, um, of like the hev heaviest, most encoded ads for the pharmaceutical companies. And so if you look at modern day pharmaceutical companies and what their commercials look like, the messaging is so sophisticated. Everything from beginning to end, everything about it is so strategic from the name of the drug to the logo, to just everything from the first frame to the last frame, everything is completely calculated you know, um, to the nines, like you wouldn't believe, you know, and it's all meant 
to get you to think a certain way about what they're putting out there. Um, and also, too, Hollywood is completely, you know, intermingled with the military industrial complex. And it's just it's been like that for a very long time. You know, so there's even a book called Operation Hollywood, you know, so it's like when I see a Marvel movie or when I see any mainstream movie, you're looking at a military program. That's what you're looking at. You know, these things just don't come out for the sake of your entertainment, uh, just so that, you know, you can have a fun afternoon with your family and have popcorn or whatever. No, you're being programmed. It's called programming for a reason, you know? Yeah. 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 So basically, um, graphic designers and psychologists are the actual Illuminati. <laughs> well, you know, uh, maybe they work in tandem or what have you. But uh, yeah, you know, there's something to be said about all of that, for sure, you know. And I'll say, too, just from my personal experience, you know, when you get into occultism, my personal opinion is that occultism really is, it's ancient psychology, you know. So you're actually learning how the ancient mind works. You're learning that, you know, uh, humanity has a psychological profile, and we're going to associate certain things with, with symbols, okay? And so, like, occultism at its best, you're going to learn how your psychology works. You're going to learn how your spirit works. And therefore, you're going to learn how other people's programming and psychology works, right? You know, black magic, in my opinion, in a lot of ways, and I actually, when it comes to black magic and white magic, I think that there's positive and negative black magic, and I think there's positive and negative white magic, um, personally. So I can't say that, you know, I know people who do black magic that are not in it for nefarious purposes. They're actually doing some interesting things. I know people who are interested in white magic. They think it's white magic, but it's actually darker than what they realize. You know what I mean? And so it's just like, I almost can't say any blanket statement about the light or the dark. I think that, you know, for me personally, I, I want to understand both sides, you know? Um, but, um, you know, so occultism is ancient psychology. And so they know the little triggers that work because they know the history behind some of these symbols. And they understand that when you see a cube, as an example, it represents something very, very deep. When you see a triangle, when you see a pyramid, when you see an eye, you know, there's all of these different things that it kind of um, comes attached with. And so they know the things that work on people to get them to do X, Y, or Z. And so I started learning about occult symbolism. And at a certain point, I wanted to experiment with my clients. And I wanted to see if, if I used occult symbolism for, uh, you know, some designs that I came up with for my clients, because I've done dozens of logos throughout the ages, you know, throughout the years. And so um, I started putting in, you know, I'll design a dozen logos. And I'll put in, um, you know, a symbol that I just learned about, and it might have an occult nature to it, or it might have some sort of esoteric meaning to it or whatever. And I just wanted to see what would happen. And I did this two or three times in a row with a client. Dude, I shit you not, it was amazing. Every single time, that's what they chose. Really? Yeah, because there's a deep resonance there. There's a reason why these symbols have survived, you know, um, all this time. You know, and so I was really surprised, to be honest. And I was like, I'm just doing this as an experiment. I'm not telling them what's going on. And sure enough, that is like what they picked because of, I think, this deep well of information that ties into our psychology and everything. So for what that's worth, that's just a really, really small example of me personally kind of playing around with some of the stuff and seeing like what resonates and Sure enough, man, they, that's what they chose to, to roll with. Yeah, it kind of all started with Edward Bernays, right? Sigmund Freud's uh, nephew? Uh, I would say kind of like the, the modern sort of uh, version of it. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, he's a wild dude. I haven't dug too deep into him, but um, apparently, yeah, uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, uh, Edward Bernays, he kind of ushered in or pioneered that whole science between, um, you know, subliminal messaging. Right. Right. Yes, for sure. Exactly right. Yeah. So there's a whole history here with all this stuff. But even before then, you know, there's empires who, um, you know, even just there's core astrologers, 
You know, there were court astrologers. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, she had a court astrologer. Um, it's been the esoteric information and occult information and underground information has always been completely tied in and mixed up with the elites and what they're up to. So they've always had advisors that have shown them, you know, what to do, how to do it, what's going to be effective, things like that. Even Crowley. Crowley, who was he? What was he actually up to? I can't say for sure. I think he's kind of this very mysterious sort of thing. In some ways, I think he was a construct. Even when I Google image Crowley, I feel as though there's multiple Crowleys. I don't know if there was just one Crowley. I feel as though there may have been several Crowleys. But they say that he was a advisor to William Churchill, Winston Churchill, excuse me, and that he gave him the uh, V for victory uh, hand gesture. And so Crowley was even an advisor to modern day elitists and politicians and things like that. And that's always how it's been. So the underground world has always affected the above ground world. So occultism and underground culture has always had a massive, huge, gigantic influence on what happens in the above ground mainstream world. And so most people don't realize that, right? And so most people think that there's this separation. They don't even know what's going on in the occult world or in esoterica or anything like that. But in actuality, it influences what happens in mainstream pop culture, you know? And so that's just kind of the deal. Someone mentioned the Beatles in the chat. Um, the Beatles, there's a lot of stuff going on with their material uh, and some of their album covers and some of their lyrics and everything else that suggests that they were occultists, you know, that there was something going on there. So imagine this, if you had a network, if you had a, um, well, Mario, a way, yeah. Sorry to cut you off, but I think the live is about to cut out, so we might have to hop back in. Is that right, really? Okay, no worries. Yeah, giving me a countdown, so everybody okay. stay tuned. We're going to cut out, and we're going to hop back in and, and uh, go where we left off from. Sounds good. All right, All right see ya. What up, what up? Uh, welcome to part two with Symbolic Studies. Let's jump back in. Yo, yo. Hey. <laughs> okay. Yeah, weird Instagram thing, I guess, now it only allows you to go live like an hour or something. Oh, I see. Whoa, that flew by. All right. <laughs> um, so, you know. Populate real quick and then we'll jump back in. Sure. Right on. Right on. Yeah, sounds good. And then we did have some questions. Um, I'm going to get to those. Cool. Too. Uh, all right. I think we're good now. Um, all right. Carry on, brother. Yeah, so I think I was talking about occult advisors. There's a whole history here. John D. he was a court astrologer. He was called, his nickname was 007. He was the first 007. That's where James Bond gets his 007 acronym or uh, name from, his handle from. And so this has been a tradition that the elitists use occultism this ancient psychology, all of these different things, you know, um, it's all at their disposal. This is the deal. And so it's always been like this. I don't think it'll ever not be that way. So when you watch the news, man, I mean, there is so much black magic going on in the news. There's so much black magic going on in Hollywood. There's a lot of black magic in the most popular things you can imagine in uh, the most popular music videos in the most popular celebrities work, whatever it might be, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And either you're aware of it or you're not aware of it. And that's just the deal. And so I personally would rather be aware of it. I'd rather know what's going on than, than not. And I'm grateful and am glad that I decided to pursue this sort of journey so that I can actually see some of this stuff for myself. Because ultimately for me, you know, I just don't wanna get played with anything. And so whenever there's any news story, you know how many news stories are just, they're fabrications, basically. And so you could put a headline out there, and you're actually just encoding an occult ritual. 
you know, you're never going to verify if this event did or did not happen the way that they said it happened. You're never going to verify all of the things that people consume on a daily basis. You're never going to verify if any of these things are actually accurate or not. And so every once in a while, something is seated in there that is 100% an occult ritual, you know, and it's probably done based on the stars and what's happening in the heavens and whatever their astrology is and everything else. So to me, it's just like, that's just the world we live in essentially. Yeah. Yeah, man. That kind of blew my mind when you said there was uh, multiple Crowley's. I'm like, dude, multiverse Crowley. That's the movie we need. <laughs> right. Right. You should look into it. I think there's actually a lot of celebrities. That's the other thing. There's a lot of people that, everyone just assumes their story is accurate and true and everything else. And it's just not the case. So um, when you get into this kind of information, um, your skepticism of what's actually happening in the world completely skyrockets. And so I just don't take anything at face value anymore because I realize what I was going to say is that let's just say you run a huge network. Let's say you run Hollywood or something like that. And you are able to dictate what comes out. You run a huge uh, media outlet and you get to dictate what comes out. Why wouldn't you use every advantage you have to increase your wealth and increase your power? You're, you're not going to use this network. You're not going to use this channel to educate people. You're not going to use it to um, wake them up. You're not going to use it to better them. You're going to use it to better benefit yourself. And it's just always been like that. So if you've had the opportunity, if you created the opportunity to have a massive audience, to have a, a lot of eyeballs on whatever it is you put out there, you're going to use every single advantage at your disposal to increase your power. In my opinion, you know, they're not in it to inform us. You know, that's not what it's for. It's, it's, uh, it's, there's agendas behind it you know, and there's uh, programming things behind it. And so that's just my personal opinion. I think that that's kind of the deal with all of this stuff. You don't become a billionaire because you're trying to educate and, you know, um, uh, wake people up to their divinity. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, great stuff. I'm going to get to some of these questions that we had in the other live. Sure. Um, so Lily Middle Mistred. What up? I uh, wanted to ask you, what is the most mysterious zodiac sign? Oh, that's a good question. I would say off the top of my head, it probably is Scorpio. Because Scorpio, largely, if you read, um, you know, certain books, they will say that Scorpio is like the deepest sign. And I'm not sure if that's 100% accurate. But I've read that multiple times from authors that I really respect and admire is that Scorpio has the deepest well of information associated to it. And so even, you, you know, it's a really common thing to talk about Scorpio's various aspects. And so there is the scorpion itself. There's the serpent. There's uh, the eagle. Uh, there's the phoenix. There's a lot of creatures that are tied to Scorpio and there's more than one aspect of Scorpio. And just by virtue of what it's all about, it also corresponds with the genitals. It corresponds with our sexual organs. And so there's a deep well of information um, with that. And so that would be my answer is that I think Scorpio probably has the most going for it that way. Also, it's during Scorpio, do we have Halloween? And so there's a lot of interesting alchemical stuff tied to Scorpio. It's during Halloween, and it's also during the Day of the Dead. And so this is when the veil is thinnest. And so this is why people believe that we're better able to communicate with our ancestors and things of that sort. And so Scorpio is just kind of a thin sort of veil. And I think that you could almost symbolically, I think I put it in a, a video, that you can hear whispers from the other side, you know, that the veil is so thin that there actually is some sort of um, way to kind of communicate with what's going on in, uh, in other realms. 
And so someone here said it's all the water signs. You know, I could see that too, for sure. And so Scorpio is a water sign, right? And so that, that would be my answer personally. There's a lot of stuff going on there for sure. Okay. Okay. So if you're going to date a Scorpio, then get ready for some, some uh, dark and mysterious. <laughs> uh, be ready for sure. You know, uh, yeah, I would say that much. Absolutely. That's really okay. funny. I'm going to wrap this next question into, well, there are two questions. I'm going to try and wrap it into one question. Um, somebody asked in the question box, I, I lost their name because of the, because we glitched out, but um, sure. that person was asking, you know, how to stick a geometry tied to symbolic studies. And then I saw somebody else in the chat ask, um, can you talk about the Merkaba, which is basically sacred geometry also. So what's the Merkaba, what's sacred geometry and how does that tie into to your work? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> so I would say sacred geometry, you know, is baked in to everything i don't think you can actually escape it here everything there's a sacred geometry correspondence or component with all of symbolism with all of mythology and so if you just look into any of this stuff you may not even realize if you're an astrologer that you're tapping into the well of sacred geometry because it's just it's all there it, this all this whole reality exists because of the sacred geometry you know everything too having to do with astrology and esoterica can be i think distilled down to a sacred geometry aspect and then also to a numerological aspect as well and there are other people who could speak to this um much more deeply and i know some people that actually are way 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 into this angle with everything but i think ultimately they're right and so they could almost take any myth and they could break it down to its numerological correspondence to its sacred geometry correspondence and everything else so it's all just part of the same everything so in a way even words as an example if you get into gematria if you get into um translating what words mean there's there's a numerological aspect or component to every single letter to every single word right and so in a way when we're communicating right now words are just a proxy for probably what what equates to just a numerological value essentially it's just an easier way for us to communicate instead of you know just spitting out code or whatever and so in a way i would say sacred geometry even though i may not explicitly talk about it as such it's baked into everything that i do it, it's baked into everything that i'm interested in um, when it comes down to it and as far as the merkaba goes that's a really interesting question because my understanding of the merkaba when i truly think about it the merkaba is our vehicle it's it's a vehicle that we use it's it's a uh, aspect of us that symbolically represents our ability to travel and so I would say the symbolic correspondence that's really easy for people to wrap their heads around is the chariot. And I would say by extension, the chariot card in the tarot. And so the Merkaba is acknowledging us as a vessel that is able to travel and is able to move. And so it's been related to uh, being a chariot and being our own personal chariot. And so what I think happens here, I think we live this life and I think we have the experiences that we do. And then I think that we travel to the other side upon death. And so this is what psychopomps are there for. Psychopomps like Mercury, like I was talking about earlier, they are there to guide us to the next realm, to show us the way to go through that uh, bridge or to, uh, to cross that gap to, um, use, in my opinion, uh, to go through the, uh, the stairway to heaven, you know, to go through this process or whatever. It's a process, you know, and a lot of cultures have talked about the afterlife process and what that's all about. And I tend to associate the afterlife process with the number seven. I think there's seven general steps. I think there's seven processes um, to get from here to the other side. And I think the other way around as well. I think that there's seven steps when you descend into this realm or this reality as well. That's why there's so many things in this reality that are connected to the number seven. So there's seven days of the week, there's seven colors of the rainbow. There's seven is a really, really important significant number. And 
Seven is also the chariot card. And so this is the chariot that I'm speaking about. And these, uh, there's a relationship too with uh, the seven stars of Ursa Major as well and everything that I'm referring to. So it's a whole big thread that you can pull out essentially. But that to me is what the Merkaba is. So when you're referring to the Merkaba, it is the, uh, the mythology or the symbolism of us being able to travel between places and between realms and everything else. And I think that that's kind of a big part of what we do here is that we, we journey here. You know, that's why uh, the major arcana, it starts with the fool. And we refer to the major arcana as the path of the fool because you are journeying here in so many ways. And so I think that that's kind of, um, th those are the first things that I think about when I think of the Merkaba. I think of the Merkaba as being our uh, personal chariot that allows us to ascend. There's ascension material that refers to the Merkaba um, that you need to use your Merkaba to travel between realms. And so there's a whole branch of Jewish mysticism actually called Merkaba mysticism, chariot mysticism, essentially. And I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I think Merkaba actually translates to, um, to, to chariot, maybe, perhaps. But yeah, there, there's a lot of stuff having to do with us uh, going between realms, between realities, between densities and frequencies and everything else. And we do it via this vehicle. So when you see chariot symbolism, when you see boat symbolism, when you see horse symbolism, it's essentially talking about the same thing. You know, these are all very similar symbols. And to me, the highest aspect or the grandest aspect of these symbols is journeying to the other side. And so the boat has been used that way. The chariot has been used that way. The horse has been used that way. There's been uh, psychopomps that ride horses, as an example. They say death rides a horse. The death card, uh, some traditional versions of the death card, you will see death on a horse because he's taking you to the other side, essentially. And chariots, yeah. generally, we associate horses with pulling the chariot. Yeah, and I think Mer Merkaba, I think, might be derived from the Egyptian words Ka and Ba, which are like uh, for the soul. Exactly right. Yes, one hundred percent for sure. Uh, yeah, dude, the first I remember the first time I I, heard, I learned Merkaba, I was in ninth grade back in like two thousand nine, and I was reading some of Bob Frisell, and he introduced me to Genvalo Melchizedek. Yeah, right. He's the, he's the guy who did the whole Flower of Life um, presentations and stuff like that. But I remember reading about the Merkaba and how, like you just explained, it's like a light vehicle. It's our, it's our true form and it's a, it's a vehicle. And when you meditate and open it up, it activates. And he said it would like, it, it expands like 10 feet or something like just some, some wild stuff. And I remember reading that as like a freshman. And I was just like trying to tell my friend about it. Like, dude, we're actually this thing called the Merkaba and we can fly. And he was just like, what dude? Like, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, but, no, exactly right. You got it, man. That, that's my understanding as well, basically, is that it's a metaphor for our ability to travel uh, between realms. Yeah, man. All right. Um, so we're going to start wrapping it up, everybody. So last chance to ask questions. We got one right now from a buxom pony. What up? Um, and she is asking, does he know why MAGA is used for we the people? Did he realize, um, I'm guessing Trump, it was Magi etymology. Of course, he must have. I'm curious. Love the work, guys. Both of you. Thank you. So, is he was he aware of what he was doing with the Maga, uh, with with that tagline? Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And I wouldn't say him personally. I think he has handlers. You know, so um, I think he's another construct. So when I see people on that level, I don't look at them as real people personally. I think there might be an aspect of them as being a real person, but I think that they have a team. There's a team. That's one thing that people don't realize as well is that there's people in the public eye that have teams behind them that facilitate their messaging. So when yeah, they come up- Mario, sorry to cut you off, but I guess I got no a question on a Bucks and Pony saying, did you know it was Magi etymology? That's her question. Oh, um, you know, I haven't, I've read a few things about uh, MAGA and what it means. And there was actually something very recently, I wasn't even looking into it at all. And it had another interpretation of what that means esoterically. And I cannot recall what it is, but 100%, 100%.
I would say if you see a tagline out in public, if you see something that's being said over and over and over again, if there's something that's kind of being shoved down your throat, as an example, in the media, in the mainstream media, you could almost guarantee that there's a spell behind it. There's some sort of spell behind it. So that's why I try and not adopt those things for myself. And I'd rather be very skeptical of, um, you know, what I choose to bring into my vessel and into my sphere, because there's probably some sort of thing attached to it that you may not even realize. So yeah, I, I would not be surprised if there's all sorts of different things attached to MAGA uh, and it relating to Magi as well. I'm just not aware specifically of what that's all about. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, this has been fascinating, dude. It looks like the people had a great time and they definitely want us to do this again sometime. Nice. Um, oh, got another question. Uh, sure. Okay, so Olivia Rudio, what's up? What's the difference between Temperance and Star Card? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, because there's a lot of overlap. They both have two vessels. I would say the way I kind of look at it, I think that there's a lot of alchemical information attached to the Temperance card. I think the mixing of the cups is symbolic of that. I think that there's a deep healing aspect to the temperance card as well. Sometimes she has that disc that uh, old timey doctors used to wear, you know, it's this little silver disc thing. And so when she's wearing that and she's wearing the right white robe, which is symbolic of purity, I look at this card as is this self healing sort of thing. And when I see the star card and I notice the similarities and the differences, personally, I look at the star card as being the uh, healed aspect of what's presented in the temperance card. So I think that what you're seeing is the star, she's nude, she's vulnerable, she's exposed. I think she basically represents that healing modality fulfilled from the temperance card. Um, that's kind of how I tend to see it personally. And the temperance card is associated with Sagittarius. I think about Chiron and Chiron symbolism and Chiron's hidden wound and all of that information. And so I think it's the healing journey, but I think it's earlier on. And then I think the star card is potentially um, after that healing process is kind of how I look at it. All right, all right, cool, man. Yeah. Well, uh... Mario, uh, is there anything that you want to say to the people, any projects you got going on, any last messages? You know, just want to say thanks, man, for having me. This was awesome. I think this is the first Instagram Live I've done, so that's rad. And if people are interested in tarot readings or study sessions, that's something that I'm doing for people, is offering consultations and study sessions. Um, they can just reach out, and you can find me here on Instagram or uh, go to symbolicstudies.com. I'm all over the place. I try and be accessible to people. But uh, otherwise, that's pretty much it. This was really fun. Absolutely, man. Thank you for hanging out, Mario. For sure. Everybody for hanging out. Probably going to upload this to YouTube if it's, if it's okay with you, Mario. Absolutely, man. Go for it. Some point, I'll edit it and put it up on there so everybody can watch it again. Um, cool. But yeah, man. So thanks again. Thank you, everybody. And I hope everybody has a great day. All right, man. Take care. See you.